I'm Mason Mount. You're listening to the London is Blue podcast. All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London is Blue podcast. Coming at you as we are still without football in lockdown. We're going to be doing the three part of this week. Nick is joining me, but no Dan. Dan has earned the weekend off, Nick, celebrating his wedding anniversary with his lovely wife, hiking around Portland, staying away uh, from us as far as he possibly can. I believe that was up to Terry. Good good weekend to get away, for sure. Um, You know, there's obviously a lot going on in the world right now, but I obviously wish them a a good, happy-ish wedding anniversary, (laughs) as as happy as it could be with, with everything going on. And We'll catch Dan on the flip side. We have a lot of content coming out over the next month. Well, joining us uh, as another guest that we've been having in this kind of non-football series, uh, familiar voice on this platform. And also, uh, if you pay attention to Chelsea News in the last however many years Liam's been doing this, we have Liam Toomey welcoming back um, writer for The Athletic this time. That's the first time we've gotten to say that. So welcome, Liam. Really? Wow, yeah, I didn't realize I hadn't been on earlier. Sorry I wasn't on earlier in the lockdown, but it probably works best if we're doing video because I've only just mastered the art of cutting my own hair. <laughs> well done. It not took me. a while. I've mastered the art of wearing a hat every <laughs> <Yep>. day. <laughs> but hey, June 1st for us. I can go get my hair cut June 1st, which is tomorrow. I'm excited. Uh, yeah, obviously, a uh, friend of the pod, uh, excited to get back. Um, been loving what you've been doing. Uh, With The Athletic, obviously, you guys have continued to churn out content in this time. So well done to you and Simon and the rest of the team. Um, But right out of the gate, I mean, I don't know if you've heard of this person, Football Therapy, at Football Yannick on Twitter, usually trolls us pretty hard. Uh, First question says, kickups. He wants the truth. His true ability is unknown. How many? And to give context, right, in a couple weeks ago on your podcast, Um, Simon Johnson had done two or three in the back garden and that like beat his daughter because the foot was it footballers were doing a keepy uppy challenge or something. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, Simon set the standard on your podcast with about three. And so, uh, apparently Yan doesn't want to let this go. He wants answers. Yeah. I, I, I know of Yannick a bit. We've, we've had a few interactions on, on Twitter. Um, it started off as a, a little kind of in joke on our, on our straight out Cobham po- podcast, Matt Davis Adams, our host, um, was, was, I can't remember, even remember whether I brought it up or he brought it up about doing keepy uppies. Um, and I've with been the doing toilet paper. It was with toilet paper. That was what footballers were doing. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm not, that, I can't do that. <laughs> um, I need, I need a ball. Um, but I, I've been in the apartment block I'm in. We've got like a quite a nice roof terrace, um, which is a communal space. But I've been going up there every now and then and doing some some kickups with a size one ball, which is the mm-hmm. one I got from um, the Nissan car dealership where I interviewed Jose Basinga a couple of months ago. Uh, it, <laughs> that I got is a story. I can't wait. <laughs> it, it was part of the Champions League trophy tour. They were giving away mini balls. So I got one. Um, and I finally found a use for it once Perfect. the lockdown started because I've really been missing five aside. Um, and one way or another, it came up, um, and Matt said, uh, "See how many you can do." And so I, I made a little little video on the on the roof. But the pr- thing is, I don't actually know how many keepy uppies I can do. Maybe that means my potential is untapped. I'm not. I'm not mm. sure. But if I try to count as I'm doing it, then I, I screw it up. So. I need I need someone else to count. I think in the video that I posted on Twitter, Matt counted 59. I'm taking him his word on that. Um, and I also made it clear that I could have carried on. You just got I, bored. I, 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 try, I tried a silly little trick, you know, just to end <laughs> the video with a flourish. And I'm also aware that people don't want to watch a five-minute video. We've all got short attention spans. So. Um, I, he's challenged me to 250 now before lockdown's over, so... We'll have to we'll do a little s- speed ramping on that video to, to speed it up a little bit for you. Uh, yeah, no, we love Yan. Uh, he's good stuff. Um, okay, now, before we get into Project Restart, Nick, you've got a heavy burden here, all right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I'm doing a, a quick plug. We, we have a, a new partner on for the next few weeks that just want to 
quickly tap into uh, signables. So if you go to signables.com, we're gonna have a, a promo code at the end of this. Um, they are kind of out to improve the autograph experience by offering authentic uh, display ready keepsakes. Uh, they have a patented product that is a, the only collectible of its kind. It's a flat match, um, match leather soccer ball with, with the signature on it. Um, so th there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can do with these. A lot of people are kind of plussing up their home office uh, during this time of lockdown when they need to be on Zoom calls and, and look good like Brandon does with his, his nice setup. Um, they kind of have five Chelsea players available. Uh, Pulisic, Conte, Aspi, William, and Pedro available for purchase. We're going to be doing a giveaway on our Instagram page in the next few days with them. So kind of look out on that front. But if you, uh, if you use the code LIB20 for 20% off, you go to signables.com. That's how it all works. All right. Well, that will be interesting. Uh, definitely looking forward to hearing more about that. I appreciate that. But it is project restart time. So football is kind of returning, obviously, in a different form. So let's take a look at the latest news and get perspectives on how it might all work. And obviously, Liam is the perfect person uh, to talk about this. So the structure of it um, is that they want the Premier League and the EFL to return to action in June. Sounds like we feel pretty confident that mid to late June, this is all going to happen. Uh, the Premier League welcomes government's announcement today. A statement from the Premier League said, all major sports, including the Premier League, have been working with DCMS to produce the Stage 3 protocol. We have provisionally planned the restart to restart the Premier League on June 17th. But there's still much work to be done to ensure all the safety involved. Um, so some of the guidance that the government has for that includes um, players traveling alone to venues, being screened for coronavirus symptoms, and maintaining social distancing where possible. Um, and then, I guess, Nick, do you want to talk through kind of the subs and what a week end match schedule and a weekday match schedule will look like? Because this is, this is wild. Like, this is condensed. Yeah, I, I guess, firstly, I want, you know, want to get your reactions on – you know, just kind of the, the announcement that was made this week around the timing of the return. Um, there was, I think, some rumors that it would be a little bit later than June 17th, but they've kind of settled on that date. So I guess, what are you kind of hearing around that? And do you think it's it's likely to stay that way? Or if, you know, if you feel like it'll be pushed back, let us know that too. Well, I think they are going to um, really do everything they can to make sure they do come back on June 17th. Um, a lot of the concerns that clubs and players have had have been addressed in one form or another over the last week or two um, by you know, scientific advice, by the, the conversations they've been having with government, but also, I think, by the example of the Bundesliga. The fact that the Bundesliga has been back and they've managed to make this work and they've managed to actually play the games through positive tests without too much disruption um, I think has given that external push that was needed to, to break a little bit of an impasse in the talks and to show some of the more doubtful clubs, players and managers that it, that it can be done. It's not going to be easy and it's going to be expensive to create this bubble and maintain it. Um, but I think they will do everything they can to, to return on that date. I think it's all the teams are going to play their first games back between June 17th and June 20th, I believe. So we don't quite know which one's going to fall, which fixtures are going to fall on which days yet. Um, but I think the other aspect of it is that they're in a kind of race with La Liga as well as to who can come back first. Um, because I think both leagues are quite well aware that the league that, out of the two of them, the league that comes back first might have a better chance of getting some more eyeballs on it while there isn't a lot of other sports to compete with. So that all sounds quite callous when you're talking about the what's going on in the wider world. But this is a, a business conversation, essentially, when you're talking about the Premier League. And in order to get the cash flow moving again and, and try to preserve the whole ecosystem, um, they have to get back and they have to honour the rest of those broadcast deals by kind of mid-July, mid, mid, -July, mid to late July, I think it all has to be done. So that's just the way it has to be. And I think they're going to make every effort to do it. Well, and, and part of the way they're going to try and workshop around this, right, is 
There are going to be uh, five subs that are made available during three substitution periods, very much like Germany, even though they kind of messed that up the first weekend where they had five substitution periods. Um, so that, I think that's kind of more FIFA guidance that the Premier League's adopted, at least from what I read. And then the match schedules are going to be absolutely stacked top to bottom every weekend and week uh, to make this happen. So uh, weekend schedules for us in the States will be something to the effect of Friday, 3 p.m., Saturday, 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., 3 p.m., Sunday, the same, well, basically the same, uh, except an hour behind that. And then Mondays at 3 p.m. Eastern with a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday fixtures at 1 and 3. So, <laughs> Hope you got a comfy couch. Oh, man. Oh, we do. <laughs> um, Liam, Ameri- let's... Americans have been set up for this for years. Right. Liam, all right. <laughs> this is March Madness all over again. It's, it's crazy. Uh, I just want to get your perspective on, on that. I mean, uh, before we dive into Chelsea pictures, players obviously haven't been training for three months, like properly training. There's going to be essentially a uh, another uh, festive period worth of congestion, you know, for a couple of months in the midsummer. How do you think that's all going to work? Well, I think we're going to see injuries. Um, that That's pretty much inevitable. I think you saw when the Bundesliga came back on the first match week over that weekend, there were 12 injuries across the division. Um, so I, I would expect to see Premier League clubs um, suffering along those same lines. And, and it will be interesting to see how different managers try to navigate that with the five subs. Um, and, you know, you, you would think it would suit the clubs that have bigger squads, of which Chelsea has certainly won. Um, but it's also a little bit more of a sprint than a marathon. So the the dynamic's been changed by this unscheduled stoppage in other ways too. Like Jamie Vardy was struggling with injury and Golo Kante, Harry Kane was probably not going to play much more of a part in the season. And now all of a sudden he could be back in play again. So I think we we have to accept on a lot of different levels that, that the sporting integrity we thought we had before this stoppage is gone and there's no way of getting it back. We just have to make the best of it and try to honour the games as, as, as best we can. Um, I know that there's still some level of debate among certain Premier League clubs, namely the bottom five or six, about wanting relegation scrapped. I don't see that happening because I don't see the broadcasters agreeing to it. I don't see the other clubs agreeing to it. And certainly the championship will be up in arms because those top clubs want to be in the Premier League next year. Um, so I, th- I think it will come back in, in current form. I think the five sub rule will be the only significant rule change we get. And clubs will have different problems to deal with than than they would have had in normal circumstances, but they may also have some players to call upon that they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, And you think of momentum, right? Chelsea had some good momentum, but, you know, got drubbed by Bayern. You know, you have to come back and play Bayern again, right? And then Man City. So, like, we've gotten some breaks too. And the injuries Chelsea had. Uh, Manchester United were on a bit of form. That has been completely halted. We've now found out that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer drives a Volvo. Made us feel really confident about our abilities. <laughs> this Lampard rolled in in his Bentley. <laughs> but being serious, um, Chelsea still will come back to Villa. And then we'll play Man City, West Ham, Watford, Palace, Sheffield United, who are pushing for European glory, Norwich City, Liverpool, Wolves. That's the league. What, if anything, happens with the Champions League? We still have the second leg of Bayern. And we obviously still have the FA Cup, which it sounds like they want to play. And we have Leicester City drawn June 27th and 28th somewhere in there with the final being on August 1st, which <laughs> my birthday's the second. So I'm just saying Chelsea, let's do the thing because best birthday gift ever would be an FA cup trophy. Um, Cause that'll never happen again at that time of year. So that kind of gives us an idea of where we're at. Um, the two big things, Liam, that are still out there or, or that I guess are big talking points, are obviously testing uh, the most recent announcement is that they had zero new cases of coronavirus, which, and it was over 1,130 players and staff, which 
if true, is impressive. Um, and then the other one is obviously where these matches are being played. It sounds like we've settled the debate of neutral venues and where we're going to play home and away, but it sounds like there's going to be some exceptions down the, down the line. So I guess I just want to let you kind of speak to the testing part uh, and then obviously talking about the, the home and away venue type situations. Well, I think they're, they're going to need an awful lot of tests to finish the season to do these bi-weekly rounds of testing. Um, but that seems to be the supply of that already seems to be secure. And obviously from a, from a PR point of view, the Premier League has to make it very clear throughout that they are not taking away um, supplies that are needed for public health England and the NHS and, you know, key workers that, that should obviously take priority at a time like this. But I believe those, those concerns have, have been allayed for now. Um, they it's going to be a huge, huge logistical challenge. You know, I know from from talking to people around Chelsea the last the last week or two, Cobham is still a pretty ghostly place right now. You know, players are players are training, but it is essential personnel only. It's basically the squad, the coaches, um, a photographer <laughs> standing a mile away to 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 get some pictures for the for the Twitter account, and that's about it. You know. It, there, there are a lot of staff who, who do work at Cobham day in, day out, who just can't get in right now because those are the kind of security um, protocols that have to be in place across all the clubs. And the, the issue around venues, um, I think, is a conversation that's primarily being had with the police rather than... I don't think there's any real disagreement between the clubs. I think all of them would like to play all of their games home and away to maintain as much of that sporting integrity as they can um, and I know for, I know a lot of people around Liverpool in particular have become very very annoyed at, at the kind of implication that their fans can't be trusted in certain games if they're, if they're going if they're one win away from winning the league we know that there will be there will be idiots who who probably breach restrictions and um, and, and go too far but that's true of any any sector of society. It's not something special to football fans. Or Liverpool um, fans. The, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I think the big problem, the, the, big, the biggest problem that the Premier League could face over the next, what is it, two, three weeks until the first scheduled games are to be played is whether the, the virus situation in England changes. Um, if we have a spike of infections more broadly, as the government eases some lockdown restrictions here, you know, there's plenty of scientists coming out and saying it's too soon to be doing that. So if it backfires and the situation here becomes a lot worse, these footballers aren't completely insulated. They're not insulated from their partners, from their relatives. There are still plenty of potential sources of, of infection um, for football to become much more affected than it is right now. It's great that they've got no positives right now, but they need to be in that situation with still only no more than a handful of, of infections three weeks from now. And that we live, we're all living one day at a time in, in this pandemic. Yeah. So that it's hard to make predictions on that front. Uh, a couple of, of quick follow-ups that's Chelsea related, I guess, is, you know, we, we've seen players come out and say, Hey, we haven't done proper training in three months. We need at least a month, if not a, a little longer to get back to any sort of, of match fitness and it, and it appears like it's going to be maybe right at that benchmark, but, but maybe a shade under that, Liam, are, are you hearing anything from the players that are voicing concerns about how quickly this is getting restarted? Well, I think, yeah, players are, are concerned because I think people underestimate the intensity that is required to get someone football fit, particularly for Premier League football, which is probably, the most intense league in Europe. Um, they, there's a reason why pre-season is, is generally so arduous. Uh, and, and the one that they had under Lampard last summer was particularly difficult. Lampard wanted to put them through their, their paces. He, there were a lot of double sessions, particularly early on, to really get that conditioning in their legs for a season where you could play you know, 50, anywhere between 50 and 70 games, depending on how far you get in cup competitions. And, it's such a it's such a precise program that they set out 
in the in the summer to try and get these players peaking at the right time that suddenly if you have a two three month unscheduled break it throws everything out of whack and I know that they've given Chelsea gave these tailored individual fitness programs to all the players they sent out the exercise bikes they did all they could basically um but if you're just working on a bike and maybe running around your garden a little bit or if you're as Pilaqueta met doing exercises with your dog you know it's it's not going to get you fit enough to play a proper Premier League um intensity so that that's a worry I think for the whole league because they don't really want the the competition to come back and be be even more of a diminished product than it already will be without fans you don't want the the spectacle on the pitch to be to be worse because players aren't as fit but again I think if you look at the example of the Bundesliga I watched the Dortmund Bayern game and that's only what, a week two weeks into the resumption of play and that was a really high level and a really intense match so I think it shows that it can be done it's just not ideal and not easy Look, you just got to pipe in some fan music, some cardboard cutouts. If you're in Japan, maybe some sex dolls, and you've got an atmosphere. (laughs) Um, Great transition point, uh, Brandon. Thank you for that. Uh, Final final question for me, Liam, is obviously there's been a lot made on N'Golo Kante and and kind of his situation being particularly difficult coming back and, and how he is at least as of now is likely to miss the start of project restart. Um, so he will not be restarting as much. Um, do you have any additional thoughts or context on Angola Conte's situation? It's just a, a really difficult one for everyone involved. Um, I mean, Kante's reservations, first of all, he's, he's far from the only player to be worried about playing in this situation. Yeah. He's maybe the most high profile, but he's certainly not the only one. Uh, and his his worries are completely ju- justifiable and understandable, given what he's been through. You know, he's had a few health scares of his own during the lockdown. He thought he had the virus at one point. Um, it turned out that he didn't, but he thought he did, and and he's still worried about getting it because his brother died of a heart attack around the 2018 World Cup. He passed out after training at Cobham a couple of years ago. So he's had a few um, health scares or experienced people very, very close to him who've, who've suffered. Um, and so you can see why he would be more nervous than, than your average player. And for, for Chelsea, they've, they've set out from the start to be as understanding as possible um, and, and try to give him the time he needs. And while having conversations with him to try to address the things that he's most worried about and, and get him into a position where he's comfortable playing again. Now, as as far as we understand it, he this isn't him doubting Chelsea or the measures that they've taken. He's he trusts the club to look after him and look after the other players. What he remains to be convinced about at this point is that other clubs are the the teams that he will be competing against will be taking the same level of precautions and doing things at a similarly high standard. Um, and that's quite a difficult one for Chelsea to address because they, they can't really show indirectly what other clubs are doing. You've just got to have conversations and, and, and see how the situation develops. But it's, yeah. I think it's a, it's a huge story for Chelsea as well because he, he's training on his own at Cobham. But as we've, as we've said, that's not going to get in football fit. Um, and in the long term, having your highest paid player in the squad and, and you would argue probably Chelsea's only world-class player being paid for not playing and not even really training at full intensity is not a, a tenable situation in the long term. So we'll have to see what happens. I think this is another bright spot for Chelsea and just the way they've handled it as a club and as a family. Um, I didn't know about Angolo's kind of all the medical history in his family, but why would I? Why should I? Right? Like that's him and his family. It's now come to light as a, Hey, this is why it's a concern. Um, but anyways, uh, appreciate that. We're going to wrap part one, part two coming at you, uh, later this week. And it is going to be about transfers because what else should we talk about before football comes back than transfers? Uh, but real quick, uh, just want to remind everyone, Liam is on the athletic. Uh, so I think best place to find all of this stuff is on Twitter, twitter.com. 
um, forward slash Liam, L-I-A-M underscore to me, T-W-O-M-E-Y. Uh, anything else that you want to, that we should go to for the athletic, otherwise just the athletic.com. No, I think, I think that's it. Or, you know, the athletics Twitter account at the athletic UK, um, we'll, we'll tweet out everything that we've, that we've done every single day. So that's a good way to keep up to date with, with what we're producing. Brilliant. All right. Uh, well, thank you again, Liam, Nick for joining, uh, part two coming at you soon until the next, until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.